Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and today I'd like to talk to you about fuel pool fires. Are they possible? What causes them? And what are the consequences? Related to that is why is everybody focused on Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4? Before I get into the details, I need to go back and touch on a couple of basics. Inside a nuclear reactor, the uranium splits. And when it splits, it gives off 95% of the heat. That's what makes nuclear, nuclear fission so neat, is that a, one atom can give off an incredible amount of heat. The problem is that 5% of the heat remains in these pieces called fission products. That, that heat gradually decays away over five years, but for at least five years, these pieces, these fission products, have to be cooled. That part of the reaction doesn't occur in the nuclear reactor. It occurs in the spent fuel pool. Remember now that the uranium is in a pellet about the size of my pinky. And these pellets are put into about 12 foot long rods. And the rods are made of a material called zircaloy. And that's the problem. Zircaloy can burn in air if it gets hot enough. And it's called pyrophoric. So when it starts to burn, water cannot put out the, 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 the combustion. Now, these pellets and rods are put into bundles. The bundles are about that big and 12 feet high. And those bundles are then lifted out of the nuclear reactor and put into the spent fuel pool. Now, we know zircaloy can burn. Back in April of, of 2011, Fairwinds put a video up where we showed a single zircaloy rod burning in air. And on that video, you can actually see the piece of zircaloy bouncing across the tabletop. And it was combusting on its own. There was no flame. And it was basically burning in air with no internal uh, source of heat. The question is, can that happen in a nuclear fuel pool. And what is it about Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4 that has everyone concerned? There are four reactors in jeopardy at Fukushima Daiichi, but everyone's attention now has been focused on the fuel pool at Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4. Why is that? Well, in the Mark I design, there is no containment over the fuel pool. That means that if there's a problem in the fuel pool, there's nothing to trap the radiation and prevent it from going airborne. At Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4, though, an entire nuclear fuel core had just recently been removed from the containment, from the nuclear reactor, and was put into the spent fuel pool. That's what makes Daiichi Unit 4 unique. It's got an entire nuclear core out of the reactor out of the containment and in the fuel pool. Related to that, though, is the fact that Fukushima Daiichi 4 is also damaged. There's a bulge in the bottom of it, and I believe it's something called a first-mode Euler strut bulge, and it clearly is an indication of a seismic damage. This is not something that happened from the explosion. The building has been damaged from a seismic event. So Daiichi Unit 4 has an entire nuclear core out of the containment in a spent fuel pool, and the building it's housed in has been previously damaged by the explosions in the building and by the seismic events that occurred um, since, since March 11th of 2011. That's why all eyes in the world are focused on what's going on in Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission wanted to know if a fuel bundle can burn in air too. And they commissioned Sandia National Labs to run a test. Just by coincidence, the test was done about two weeks before the Fukushima Daiichi accident. Now, this was a test of a nuclear fuel bundle. But I need to be clear, there was no spent nuclear fuel in the bundle. The heat from the pellets was simulated using electric resistance heaters, pretty similar to what you've got inside your toaster. 
So this was a test to create the same amount of heat that the fuel pellets would create, but it was done with electricity, not with spent nuclear fuel. Other than that, though, the fuel bundle was identical to the bundle that's in a nuclear fuel pool. Now, this is a five-hour video that we've condensed down to about one minute. The screenshots that we've taken for this show in the upper left, a picture of a fuel bundle with wires going into it. That's the, that's the electricity that's designed to heat the fuel and wires coming out. Those are monitoring wires. And on the far right is top to bottom looking at the fuel bundle from the side. There is an enormous amount of data collected in these five hours and all of it is on the Sandia site which we link to from, the Fair, from this Fairwind site. The first video shows a bundle immediately before the heat was applied. Shortly after is the same bundle, the heat is on and it's already beginning to smoke. A little further on is the bundle again smoking considerably. Well where there's smoke there's fire. The, the last one in the sequence shows the bundle on fire. Now, what you're seeing is zircaloy burning in air. There was no match applied to start this fire. It just got hot enough so that it began to combust of its own volition in air. Just to be clear one last time, that was a simulated test we just watched using electricity in place of spent nuclear fuel. But it's clear that a single nuclear fuel bundle can burn in air. Now Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4 would be even worse. Inside Daiichi's fuel pool are 1,500 fuel bundles. Not one, 1,500 fuel bundles. 300 of which are just removed from the nuclear core. So instead of one very hot bundle, we've got 300 very hot bundles. Now it's even worse than that. The um, Japanese put all of their nuclear fuel from this latest core offload in a, in a very uh, confined space in the pool. In America, we don't do that. We call, uh, we call it checkerboarding. We'll put hot nuclear fuel next to cold nuclear fuel in a checkerboard pattern so that there's a gap between them. But the Japanese didn't do that. This entire nuclear core is, is side by side by side with other physically hot bundles. So is a fuel pool fire possible at Fukushima Daiichi? We've got the video evidence to show it is. And what can make it happen is the real question. In early July, the fuel pool cooling system failed at Fukushima Daiichi. Both the primary pump and the backup pump uh, failed. And for a period of several days, there was no water circulating in the fuel pool. During those days, the pool began to heat up. And it heated up at about 18 degrees Fahrenheit, about 10 degrees centigrade every day. This is a huge pool. It's, it's 300,000 gallons of water. And to think about 300,000 gallons of water heating up at 18 degrees a day gives you a feel for the amount of heat that's in that pool. So after about a week, the pool would begin to boil. And after about another week, the pool would begin to boil to the point where the top of the nuclear fuel was exposed. And an event like we saw on the, um, the, on the Sandia Labs video, it would indeed become possible. So the Japanese have about two weeks in the event that the fuel pool cooling system fails to fix it. I don't think that'll be a problem. I think they could fix almost every cooling problem in two weeks. The real problem is if there's an earthquake. The building is already structurally damaged, and if the pool were to drain from an earthquake, then all bets are off. There's no way to cool the pool, and we know that the heat source is astronomical. The fuel in the pool would catch fire, and the um, um, uranium that's then encased in the circaloid would go airborne. 
Brookhaven National Labs did a study back in 1998 about this, and they estimate that over 180,000 cancers would result from a fuel pool fire, and that an area of about 40 mile radius would have to be permanently evacuated. Now the Brookhaven study had less uranium in it than the Fukushima fuel pool, so the odds are that if a fuel pool fire were to occur at Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4, it would in fact be worse than the Brookhaven study. Regardless of what the nuclear industry claims, a fuel pool fire is possible if the water were to drain from a seismic event. Now, this is not just the Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4 problem. There's 23 Mark I reactors in the United States, and they have even more nuclear fuel in them than Unit 4 at, at Fukushima Daiichi. This is an international problem, especially in the United States, because we have the most of these Mark I reactors. What can we do about it? We can put the pressure on, the, on, the, uh, Tok on Tokyo Electric and on the Japanese government to um, get the fuel out of that pool just as quickly as possible. We can't wait for an earthquake to be proven right or wrong. In the United States, we can demand that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission take the fuel out of these fuel pools in the 23 nuclear reactors that are identical to Fukushima Daiichi. Right now, industry pressure to save money is preventing those fuel pools from being emptied. Fairlands Energy Education has tried to bring forward several really important worldwide technical issues since the accident at Fukushima Daiichi. One of them is the condition of spent fuel pools in the Mark I design. Again, we're asking for your help to continue with our energy education efforts. Maggie and I take nothing from Fairwinds Energy Education, but it does cost money to produce these videos and to do the research and development that support the videos. We're very grateful for the donations we've received so far, and we would appreciate your considering a donation now so we can continue into the future. Thank you very much. I'll keep you informed.